Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all today here for worship on this Sunday morning. Um, as we prepare to worship God, I want to bring you some announcements that are in the bulletin here. First of all, as I try to straddle this, uh, <laughs> I guess I'll just stand up really tall today, taller than usual. Um, so there are a number of announcements here today. First of all, a welcome to those of you watching us online and to all of you here today. Um, if you open up the bulletin and look at the announcements, we're getting really, coming really soon to, we're getting very close to September the 11th and the homecoming Sunday, which is the annual picnic that we have across the street in Piedmont Park. So be ready to, to come and dress casual and ready to walk across the street to share in a picnic and all the fun as we get our church program year started on September the 11th. Other announcements here, uh, Just Breathe is our weekly uh, contemplative, uh, meditative uh, session here in the sanctuary on Tuesdays. There's information about that. Also, there's a work day on September the 3rd, which is next week, followed by a barbecue as we get the church facility spruced up to start the church year. So please uh, sign up with Jay Foreman for that. The ministry fair is coming September the 25th, where you can learn all sorts of information about the various things that we do here in our congregation and through our congregation. And you can sign up to take part. If you are um, a leader of one of our ministry groups or teams in the church and would like to have a table ready for that Sunday, please just let me know. Some of you have already done so. Thank you very much. And we'll get it set up. And finally, uh, for the second week in a row, uh, the, um, there will be a table out in the courtyard for Children Rising, where you can sign up to be a tutor uh, in an Oakland school. Uh, as I said last week, there's a great, great need for tutoring uh, kids, third graders in Oakland schools. Um, just COVID has taken out so much uh, damage on, on the educational opportunity for so many kids, and especially there. So there's a great need. And so Jeff and Linda McLean will be out in the courtyard to... Uh, to um, give you information and allow you to sign up. And finally, I just wanted to call your attention to the rose here, if you can see it, on the altar. And that is to recognize the birth of Phoebe Lou Molman, daughter of David Molman, and Kira Molman, and granddaughter of Bill and Maureen. Is Bill here today? I don't know. Okay, well, we will make sure that uh, they get to see this online or however they see it. And congratulations for the gift of new life. And, and we're so thankful for the Molman family. Now let's uh, prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to the prelude. Thank you. 
invite you to join me in the call to worship. It's printed in your bulletin. God is waiting for us with a tender heart and a searching question. God is ready for us with truth and wisdom from a deep well. God is blessing us with springs and living water. God is sending us to sing, pray, and to witness every day. God is here. The conversation begin as we worship our living God. you to join me in the prayer of confession. God of tender care and thunderous power, we seek your guidance and forgiveness, for we have molded our image of you to fit our needs and have forgotten how to be awed into humility. We have been demanding of your care for our individual hurts, yet we have failed to see your wounded hands reaching towards those with greater need. We have been quick to call for your judgment on those with whom we disagree. We have sought privileged places for ourselves, yet so often we fail to see the wonder present moment and the promise of gathered community. Merciful and loving God, restore our wide-eyed, humble stance in your presence, for you are always working for good, often enough ways beyond our seeing. Blessed are you, in Jesus' name, amen. We know God's word to be true, and in his word he promises us that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us for that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's remember that today and let it affect the way we live with each other and with our God. Amen. 
Now let's stand and greet each other. Let's continue now in an attitude of prayer. Holy and loving God, we are so thankful for the abundance of life that, it, that is ours because of you. You give us a world of beauty and you give us eyes and ears and bodies and minds to behold it. You give us the joy to love other people and to receive love in return. You give us a bounty of food and seasons that change and places where we can rest and somehow take it all in. You give us all this and so much more, precious Lord, and for that we give you thanks. And God of mercy, in these still moments, we ask you, though, to forgive us for the times when we fail to pay attention, the times when we squander the bounty you've given us because we get so busy with so many tasks that we forget, lose sight of how to truly live. We attempt to kill time instead of noticing the glory of the world all around us and within us. So turn us around, God. Awaken us to the wonders we encounter in everyday lives. Open us to the realization that this day, this moment will not come again. And grant us the grace to treasure it and to share all the joys we've been given. God of healing, we lift up to your care anyone who suffers today, those who are in despair, those who are in danger, those who mourn, those who are sick. We pray for caregivers and peacemakers, for leaders of nations and institutions and communities. God of eternal life and of the present moment, we thank you that in Jesus you teach us how to live in the now. And in this way, to enjoy each simple task we do without thinking that we have to hurry on to the next thing. When we can focus on your presence as close to us as each breath we take, our minds are no longer divided and life can be more peaceful. So thank you for teaching us how to be in this way and help us to show others the way to be truly present to you and to each other. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who teaches us to pray together with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning begins with a single verse from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. And also from the gospel according to Matthew. This is Jesus speaking. So stay awake, alert. You have no idea what day your master will show up, but you do know this. You know that if the homeowner had known what time of night the burglar would arrive, he would have been there with his dogs to prevent the break-in. Be vigilant just like that. You have no idea when the Son of Man 
is going to show up. May God bless these readings of his word to our minds and our hearts today. Amen. Well, good morning. I would have been here a few weeks ago, <laughs> but I had a little detour with COVID and I'm not the only one, so I know you all know what that's been about, but thank you for your patience uh, for that. And I want to greet all of you and also everybody out there who's watching online. Uh, we never forget to invite you and to greet you as well because uh, you're part of our community. And please know that when we worship here, we know that you're worshiping with us. And so together we all become uh, a complete body as well. So if you've been uh, coming to the Sundays this past summer, you know that lately we've been doing something called a faith story series. And the idea is that we listen, and not just to the clergy types either, but also just to uh, members of the congregation about the kinds of things that brought them into not only their faith and their, their spiritual practice, but also in many cases uh, brought them to this particular community as well. And I think that you'll agree with me, it's been, it's been wonderful to hear what people have had to say and also startling to hear the diversity of stories that people have and all the, the changes and chances of life, as the old prayer used to say, that, that bring people to this moment. And so um, I, today I'm going to tell mine, and I'm going to try to not just tell stories because that's sort of dull and undisciplined, but also to try to make it, I hope, uh, relevant for, for your lives as well. So my faith story when I was a kid really starts with a single experience. Um, I was I brought up in New York City and I was a little musical kid. Uh, I played violin and piano and all of that and was going along through grade school and various other places and being pretty happy. But around sixth grade, I told my mother I wasn't particularly thrilled with the school that I was in and I was wanting to do more with music and not just playing piano and violin. By the way, uh, I came from a very musical home. My mom played piano and taught Juilliard pre-prep and played viola, and my stepfather was a cellist, and my bio biological father was a professional trombonist, so there was no way I wasn't going to be a musician. <laughs> it was absolutely everywhere. It was in the water, and, and that was fine. So my mom took it seriously when I said, I think I want to sing, too. And she heard about this choir that was attached to a church in Manhattan called St. Thomas Choir School. And if you've been to New York City, you may know about this. It's a great big Gothic pile, cathedral-sized place of a church on Fifth Avenue. And we didn't know anything about it. She thought it was just gonna be a little choir for after, after school to sing in, and, and I thought that sounded fine. Little did we know as we explored it that it was a, a boys' residential boarding school in the English cathedral style. So I went to live there we had two hours of choir rehearsal every single day and multiple services, and we sang with the men of the choir. All the boys were trebles, were sopranos, and we sang for the services of this church. And my faith story began that very first service and every service that we ever did after that. So I have to describe it to you, and if you've been there, you sort of know what this was like. Uh, this was a very high Anglican type of place, so there's a whole lot of ritual and liturgy involved. The choir would gather at the back of this football-sized building, football stadium-sized building at the back of the church, um, and there were multiple crucifers, right, with the big procession crosses, and there was a glowing pot of incense sort of waiting there. The ceilings were so high, hundreds of feet of over, you couldn't even see where they stopped. There were organs in the back and organs in the front of this enormous building. The priest would intone and the choir would respond, and I will never forget it to this day, the organ thundered into life. Thundered is the only, I think I must have leapt 15 feet into the air <laughs> when I heard that sound and all I could think was, the heck with piano lessons. <laughs> I don't wanna play that, I wanna play this really, really badly. And, and it, it was pretty much like that every single time we had worship. And what I noticed, and I was sixth grade, so I was just a little kid, so I wasn't really thinking about it, but I knew something. What I knew is that at that time, I seemed to go almost into a little dreamscape, a little dream time for me. I mean, the, the setting and, and the, the pot of incense curling up and, and the sound of the organ and the choir, it was almost sort of phantasmagoric, right? It wasn't a bright church. 
It was a very dark church, but with spots of fire and candles. And it was just really, really took me into a new kind of reality that I'd definitely never known as a kid. That was definitely my first and then repeated and repeatable encounter with God. And the things that I knew about it, even though I couldn't have described this as a kid, but I now look back and realize what I was getting from it, was that there was no sense of future or past. You know, up till then, we'd gone to church every now and then. I was baptized as a Roman Catholic, so we sort of went, and whatever it was, it was fine. And I associated church with largely be good. And in fact, I have a joke sometimes with the clergy here. I say, what's the sermon topic for this coming Sunday? Don't tell me. Be good. (laughs) Because doesn't every sermon sort of boil down to be good, right? (laughs) This was not that. This was not God saying, one day I'll be present with you if you're good. This wasn't about going back into the past and somehow, you know, wrestling with things that I might have done wrong or that anybody does wrong. This was about the present. This wasn't God saying, one day I'll be here when you're good. This was about God saying, I am good. And it was an experience I just couldn't get out of my head. It was so much that way that it it sort of left a permanent mark. That's where the church music bug bit, because I thought, well, music is great, but church music, when it's good, it's great. Bulletin, by the way, when church music is terrible, it's the worst thing in the world. (laughs) I'm there with you. But when it's great, it fulfills a need that I've had ever since that, that first day. I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So fast forward, I went through school, I went through college, I began to do an organ degree, I was also studying theology because that's what I got my PhD in because I was still really taken by all of that as well. And like most young people, I began to go through the experience of just growing older and anxiety and a restless mind and all the things that are just marks of being human. And all I knew was that I was hungry for that experience, for that experience of being in this moment beyond moral calculations, beyond needing to improve myself or worry about the, the, the past or the future. There was something here that was nourishing me. And so I, in college, I sat in, in Buddhist centers and I went and I did meditation practices and I did all of that and it sort of worked. I discovered a lot of things about meditation, one of which was I was really bad at it. Couldn't keep my mind from wandering all over the place. But still something kept me coming back to that sitting meditation cushion. So even later when I moved out to California and I actually began to start working here, I was still sitting regularly, sitting meditation practice. I went to the Zen Center in San Francisco for a long time and sat there and even helped out with a meditation group here we started and Julie McDonald a couple of weeks ago and her faith story mentioned how important that was to a bunch of us then and some of you even remember that as well. I knew that when I encountered that present moment with God, I felt complete. I also knew that I didn't always feel necessarily wonderful in it, but I knew I needed it anyway. You know, all of us can have moments where we stay in the present and it's not hard. Many of you have talked about this. Even if you're not musicians, many people have told me that the birth of their first child, they never forget it. All time stands still when they see their first child. But also others of you who are, many of you are music lovers, you'll tell me about a piece of music where everything becomes still and you don't wander off into the present and you don't wander back into the past. Everything's complete. But we also know that there are moments where things aren't full of joy and yet we still find something necessary in this moment. And I had that side of it also shown to me Um, When I was in my late 30s, this is my second big discovery about the present moment, a different shade of it. Um, My then partner and I had been together for a while, and we had both tested HIV negative, because in those days, that's what you did when you got together. And then uh, about a year or so into our relationship, uh, in routine blood work, uh, the worst happened, which is that he tested positive for HIV. 
Now, those of you who remember what those bad days were like, this was before the medications that are wonderful, that have extended life. This, this is before any of that. So I remember that day, December 2007, and he came in, and nobody needs to say anything when they're in that space. I knew something was terribly wrong. He told me, and then in the space of an hour, he'd gone from being a perfectly healthy young guy into being an AIDS patient. The cutoff there was under 200 T cells in your blood count. He had 170. Remember, this was before those medications. So nobody needed to tell us what it meant. Nobody needed to tell us where this was going. We figured he'd probably be dead within a year. So all of the usual things ensued that you can imagine, right? You may not have had this experience, but we've all had experiences like this. The crying, I remember Ed was shaking, he was so frightened. We walked down the hallway up and down in my apartment and just held each other and cried and talked. And we get through that, and then we got through the next thing that we all know we have to do in moments like that, which is you swing into action, you do whatever you have to do, right? He didn't have the proper health insurance, and those were the bad old days where they wouldn't insure you at that point. So we called everybody that we knew in the community. And boy, did they step up. And boy, to this day, if you're out there listening, thank you, you saved us. We called our insurance agent friends and our lawyer friends and our doctor friends and four days of chaos and pandemonium and phone calls and emails and, and we got it all sorted out. And around day five, and if you've been through little life tragedies, you know how this stuff goes, you pull yourself up out of the drowning waters and then whew, you finally stabilize. And then you begin to think, oh, now what's life going to be like as we go forward? And I remember he was sitting in the living room and finally watching TV and a little calmer. And I was making dinner. I think I had some spaghetti sauce on the stove. And I decided it was raining outside. I thought, Whew, we're not in crisis mode. Now will be a good time for me to do my sitting meditation a little bit because I hadn't done it in days. And I went out and sat on the little back porch outside our kitchen. And I noticed something interesting. Even though I'd been meditating for years at that point, I'd never noticed this. I had no trouble staying in the present moment. I couldn't think about the future because the future was like ashes. There was no future worth thinking about. My mind didn't stray forward to think about it. I couldn't think about the past because the past felt like it was mocking me. So with smoking ruins on one side and smoking ruins on the other, I just sat and listened to the rain. That was all I could do. And it didn't make anything better, but it nourished me. All of you have been here. I know it. We've all had a version of this. So, sure, the joyful moments, birth of a child, beautiful musical piece, those are great. The moments of complete defeat, insecurity, fear, Nobody wants those, but they also come. What occurred to me, and by the way, I should tell you that my ex is back in Ohio, has lived all these years, and is very, very healthy. So, hi, Ed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What I realized coming out of all that is I need this. I need this present moment. I need more of it. Not because it gives me a beautiful, perfect life that works out? Definitely not. But because it roots me and it anchors me and it nourishes me and it tells me who I am when I forget because I'm spinning off into the little stories of who I ought to be and who I was and how it all should be and all that stuff, which is fine but is sort of beside the point when you're sitting there and just listening to the rain. So, somewhere around my late 30s and early 40s, I got serious in a way about spiritual practice. And I decided that what I needed to do was to do exactly that first word, practice. I needed to practice it. And that's where being a music teacher came in. Because I've learned a lot of things about, about practicing as a musician myself, as a teacher. Um, and they've helped me understand, at least for me, how a spiritual practice works and what some of the pitfalls 
might be. You know, I tell students a lot that, that the bad thing about practicing anything, it can be learning a musical instrument or it can be learning how to play tennis or learning anything that's worthwhile in life where you have to apply a little, a little thought, right? I was talking to a student of mine the other day who's getting into doing uh, race car driving and that takes practice. Anything takes practice. The bad news I tell my students is that there are no grand gestures in practicing. Everything's just a little drop in the bucket. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are no grand gestures. Everything's a little drop in the bucket. You're not on the hook for all the grandiose fantasies and all the pressures about, oh, what'll I be and will it all lead to something good? That's fine, that's for another day. Right now, you practice. And so, one of the things that we do when we do a, a spiritual practice is we practice returning our mind to the present. Just bring it back, and you bring it back, and then you bring it back again, and you keep doing it. And at first, there are chapters in the life of somebody who's trying to practice spiritually. One of them is when you finally let go of the idea that if I'm doing it right, my mind stays in one place. No. If you're doing it right, you're remembering to bring it back. Right? I've told people several times, it's as though, right, you've got, this musculature is more complicated than this, but you've got two muscles on both sides of your arm. You've got your biceps and your triceps. And it's impossible to go through life without using both. But imagine for a moment if you could only use one and use the other very, very rarely. Right? If you only use your bicep, the one that pulls this way, I imagine that if you laid your arm on the table, it would just automatically start to contract. Because that's all that muscle has ever done. And this one, which is not exercised, doesn't have enough to pull it back. It's not that different with practicing, right? We, we spend our lives and we get rewarded through college and doing good jobs for being able to bring our minds into the future and out into the past. And we don't necessarily get as much practice in bringing it back. Just bringing it back. So as many times as we do that, we find that nourishment. It doesn't mean that the moments of ecstasy so don't still break in. Sometimes they do. And unfortunately, sometimes the moments of defeat can as well. But when they do, you have an ally. You have a practice. You know what to do. There's actually a group here. I can't not mention this. There's a group here that's started up, and Sarah Hirsch, a member here, is a huge part of this. Uh, she leads it. Uh, it's called Just Breathe. It's on Tuesdays from 5 30 to 6 30, happens right here in this room, where we do seated meditation. And it's not just seated. I actually, I keep calling it sitting meditation, but years uh, ago, I stopped sitting because it wasn't so good for my upper back. So now I lie down on the ground with my feet up right here on a pew. Works just great. Anything that enables you not to fall asleep, but to be able to just bring yourself back. And it's not just that we do it when we're quiet. We can also do other practices I use, and many of you do as well, a mantra practice. That's a single phrase. Sometimes it's a meaningful phrase or a sacred one, or maybe it's a little verse from the Bible that you like. And it doesn't really matter what it is. All that matters is that you repeat it. And you repeat it, you start by repeating it in the quiet of your own space, in your own home. And then after a while, over years, it starts to repeat itself. And there's nothing special. It just anchors you here and now so that we don't spin off and, and do our thing. You know, one of the things that if you read books about spiritual practice and meditation, you might get the idea that the people who do it lead very calm lives, <laughs> have very calm, perfect marriages. Everything goes right for them. I don't know who those people are. I've never met them. But I have met some people who, even in the middle of everything, manage to stay very centered. Meditation practice it's, and spiritual practice, it's not so much that it will force things to be good in your life. It definitely can't do that. Um, but it helps you to roll with the punches because you're paying attention. And instead of spinning off, you're here. I thought of this a couple days ago. I thought I'd do an experiment. I'll bet you that all of you, how many people know the old game, Name That Tune? Remember that old game, Name That Tune? I can name that tune in four notes, right? I can name it in three, that kind of thing. Well, we can do a little game right now, just as a little exercise. I'll bet you that you can name that tune in 
zero notes. I'll bet you you can foretell the future and you can tell me what the next note is in a song that you've never heard. Are you game? Yeah. All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to play something, and I'm going to prove to you that you can foretell the future. Here I go. What's... Yeah! <laughs> I thought you didn't know what was coming. And there you knew it, right? You knew it, and you had it right away. So you knew the future. But you actually sort of did, but you sort of didn't. By the way, I didn't know what that was either. I just made it up. So we both found out together. What if it did this? Oh, in music, that's called a deceptive cadence. <laughs> we don't really know where it's going. We don't really know where life might go. We don't really know about the moments of opening out into the ecstasy or sometimes the defeat. But the thing we do know, if we stay present, is that it's never that far away to come home. Because even from here, we could just go, and we're done, and we're home again. The thing which I think is important for us to know in practice is staying present, being able to be open to life, resisting the urge to have meditation or spiritual practice be about something that causes our life to slow down, to get still, right? Stop the world, I want to get off. That's not worth pursuing. I think actually after years, I finally decided when I suffer in life, and I do my fair share, it's not because things are, there's too much change and I just want to get things to be still. It's that I'm resisting the change. Change is my birthright. It's yours too. If we didn't allow change, the, the music that Leslie and I played earlier wouldn't get to the final chord. You know, when Leslie Chin, the flutist, is playing, she's right here in the present moment. She's thinking about her breath. She's thinking about the instruments, about the fingering. She's listening carefully to what I was playing on the piano. But at the same time, she's aware of the final bar, the final part of, the, of, a, of a phrase. And she directs her attention there. When Krista is singing, right, Krista isn't apart from her experience. She is the singing at that moment. But at the same time, she's aware of where it's going. She's aware of future and past learning, of which she has a lot. But she holds it lightly so that she can be here. The last thing I'll say about practice, and any kind of practice, but especially spiritual practice, is that I think it's important to hold the vision, always, for why we're doing it. You know, I read a book once, and it's okay to disagree with spiritual books. There was a book that talked about when we do uh, mindfulness practice, we weed the garden. We pluck out Various thoughts, we just see them and let them go. And I remember thinking, okay, but if you keep doing that, all you end up with is a box of dirt. <laughs> I want my life to be more than just a box of dirt. I want to plant pretty flowers and fruit and things that are nice and all of that. And so I think it's important to remember that, you know, we didn't all arrive here and go through our various spiritual paths just to sort of only be here in this moment but to be open to the moment so that we can make sure the vision that we have for our lives is always intact. And I'll say this last thing. I've said this kind of thing before, too. As a musician and as a music teacher, one of the things I'm constantly startled by is why any music student does music at all. You know, we think in our minds as grown-ups that, oh, I only do things when I get a payback. Well, I don't do it if I don't get a reward. That's not true of music. Have you ever heard, maybe you've been one, have you ever heard a kid who's learning how to play flute or violin or heaven help us trumpet in the beginning? It's not a pretty experience for everybody involved. And the thing I constantly wonder with any young musician is, why do they do it? They're not getting any immediate feedback. It doesn't sound grand in their minds. It's not going to sound grand next week either, nor the year after that. They do it because like that first experience I had, they're connecting to a deeper vision that while it's not in the present moment, what's true for the present is that they're open to the vision itself. 
and opening to that present moment, allowing the very stories that we tell ourselves that distract us from this moment, enable us to get in touch with that vision again, that vision for what that incredible experience can feel like that nourishes you. So I entitled this talk, Practicing the Present, which is what we practice. But it's really like practicing the presence, because when we practice the present, it's been my experience that we discover another thing too, if we're on a faith journey, which is that the present moment is the only place God has ever lived. God doesn't live back there. God doesn't live over in the front either, though God will be there when you get there. But God only ever lives here, and so only do you. And that moment that we feel when we open up to it, when we practice it and arrive here, it's eternal. It'll never die because it was never born. It's always been here. You've always been a part of it. So I invite you, as you examine your faith story, think about all the ways that you can give yourself and, by the way, the people you care for, the blessing of being here right now. Don't be alarmed if your mind strays. That's fine. Just bring it back. Just keep bringing it back. If you have to, tell people, I'm just trying to come back here. That's all it is. Nothing more than that. And by doing so, we open up to the presence of that living God. Let's pray. God of this very present moment, you who have been with us faithfully all these years, all these days, all these breaths we've drawn, whether we've been exhaling in triumph and joy or breathing in sharply with fear or surprise, yet underneath it all and girding it all, is your presence, breathing with us. Help us to find our way back to you in this moment, maybe if we haven't in a while. Help us to listen for you, to feel your breath in us. And help us, most importantly, to bring that quiet presence to those in our world who so deeply and desperately need it. We ask this in your name. Amen. And now in response to uh, the word that's been given to us, and thank you for that word, Steve, and your story as well and sharing it with us and especially that surprise little ending on the piano. That was wonderful. In response to all that goodness, let us give generously as we receive this morning's offering for God's ministry and the mission of this church.
the prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, because we have been given so much, help us to give more. Because we are loved so much, give us the strength to love more. Because we are accepted as we are, give us the grace to accept others without judgment or prejudice. We give ourselves and our gifts to you now with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Go forth from this place in your lives this week, being here and now, know that we're all doing it together, me included. All of us practice, God practices with us. Be there for yourself, be there for all those who need it. Be there as an open hand to the world instead of the closed fist that sometimes seems to be offered to you. Breathe, exhale, and bring that spirit of life and the Lord of life to all whom you meet. And may you go in peace today. Amen. Amen. Let's see each other outside. <laughs>